but that's what it means to be black in this country. That's not different from, you know, a black person who has struggles in their workplace, a black person who is isolated in their local community. We are all collectively going through this. And, and, and um, I, I, I think the toll that I pay is different in some ways because of my visibility, right? Because of the fact that I am now um, an author who gets invited to do things like this and that makes people in powerful places afraid. Why are people listening to this person? What do we do about that? How do we undermine their credibility and so forth? Um, but you know what? This is my birthright. This is what I have to go through in order to be who I wanna be. My maternal grandmother, um, whom my book is dedicated to, came to Canada when she was um, in her 60s. And in order to earn a pension, she was cleaning people's motel rooms. Um, that's a hard thing to do when you're an older woman in a new country, but she did. You know, um, and the kinds of sacrifices that she made, that my uh, paternal grandmother made, like babysitting my, me and my sister every day after school, you know, when my parents were still at work, the sacrifices of my mom and dad, of my uncle and aunt, um, to make sure that we had a life and a sense of who we were as Black people in this country that gives me the ability to cause all this trouble today, you know? And it's come at a cost where I, I, I can say that, um, you know, people in my family were not always comfortable with me doing the things that I do now for good reason, because they know that there's a risk associated and they know it puts a target on your back. And that's something that my mom and I still talk about uh, on a regular basis. There's, there's a sacrifice involved. Um, but if I can say this, this is where non-Black people who wanna talk about allyship and solidarity and those kinds of things, like, I don't want an ally, I want a co-conspirator. I'm on a mission here to undermine this colonial system and I want people who are convinced as I am that this is not the right way for us to live. I don't want somebody to come help me. Mm -hmm. I want people to feel like this struggle is also their struggle. That this is a spiritual, metaphysical, bigger than us, bigger than this lifetime kind of struggle that we are engaging in. And that they see some value in, in, in joining that struggle because um, it shouldn't be for us as Black people to, we're not going to take on this system by ourselves and defeat it. Um, we are going to always make sacrifices. I know that about our people. That is, that is our birthright. And that's what makes us wonderful. But if we really want to defeat white supremacy and colonialism, other people than black people who, as I said, represent 3% of the population have to be interested in black liberation for their own sake and not simply for mine. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else is also wondering if you had any thoughts on the Toronto Police Board's 81 recommendations rather than defunding the police. I can't even read those recommendations, man. Like I can't, I, I am so beyond the Toronto Police Services Board who has had as a member, the mayor of the city of Toronto, John Tory, for the entire six years that he has been the mayor now. It's six years now, I think, uh, well, it'd be six years this month or, or so, uh, approximately since John Tory has uh, been mayor of the city of Toronto. He's been on the police board all six years. I didn't, I didn't read those 81 recommendations. There are hundreds of recommendations that have come before the Toronto Police Services Board. 
regarding the murders of people like Andrew Loku, Sammy Yatim, Sylvia Cliven Gatiss, Michael Elagon. I could go on all night. Recommendations from 10 and 15 years ago have not been adopted. And this is what I'm talking about when the most, when I say the most powerful thing we can do in so many cases is stop harm. Let's stop doing something before we talk about adding on something else. The police have a new tactic in this day and age, and this is across Canada. They say, you know, we're, we're, we're like social workers. You know, we, we take all these mental health calls. We deal with people who are in crisis. It's like we're social workers. It's like, right, it's like you're social workers, except you have a gun and you have a body armor and you have a license to take people's lives without legal consequence. So you are not a social worker. Um, I feel as though those recommendations are a very clear stalling tactic and we should see that for what it is. And we should stop trying to find a middle ground between black death and black liberation and survival and thriving. We should stop trying to find a middle ground for my liberation. I don't need a middle ground for that. We said this summer, Black Lives Matter Toronto and, and other groups, they set a target and they said 50% defunding immediately. You wanna show us that you wanna make up for all of the historical um, harms that the police have done? Start with defunding 50% of the police and giving that money to community supports, not, not even social workers, because there's a trial happening in Hamilton right now um, about two paramedics mm -hmm. who came onto the scene of a young man, 18 years old, named Yosef Al Hasnawi. Mm -hmm. And Yosef was trying to intervene in a fight that he saw, and he got shot. And two paramedics came on the scene, and they were mocking him and saying that he wasn't really hurt, and then he died. I hate this story so much. It makes me so angry. But those paramedics are seen in our society as being like helpers. But in this policing system that we have, in this system that is like not really about people's health and safety and survival, but is about containment and about triage and about all of these things, the value of people's life just gets completely obscured and lost. And I wanna emphasize this because just going from a police officer to a paramedic doesn't save us. I wrote about Abdurrahman Abdi, the 37 year old Somali man, uh, Somali Canadian man who was murdered by Daniel Monsian, a police officer in Ottawa, by the way, Daniel Monsian was cleared mm -hmm. of all of the charges against him just uh, a couple of months ago now. Mm -hmm. He beat Abdurrahman to death on his front porch with a pair of reinforced carbon gloves. He punched our brother until he stopped moving and he was acquitted by a judge. The paramedics had to come to that scene and see a man lying in a pool of his own blood handcuffed behind his back and not moving. That was what the police left for the first responder paramedics to deal with. And those paramedics didn't file a complaint against the police. They didn't speak out to the media and say, we came and they were just standing over him. They weren't even helping him. They just went along with it. This is what our social workers do too. I talk about Abdul and Fatuma Abdi in my book, two young people who were taken into the child welfare system, which never applied for their citizenship. And how often this happens to black immigrants and refugee seekers in this country. Just replacing a cop with a teacher or a social worker or a paramedic, when the philosophies of dominance and the racist, you know, blueprint that we have in this country remain, Mm -hmm. That's not going to keep us safe, yeah. right? And so um, 
I really support the ambitious um, abolitionist goals that people are finally setting forward in a, in, in a new way in this country. There have always been prison abolitionists in Canada. There have always been police abolitionists in Canada. But today it's a mainstream conversation. And I'm very grateful for that. And I think that rather than, again, compromise my ability to live a free and safe life, that we shouldn't worry about these police boards. We shouldn't worry about police spokespeople. They are protecting their stack, my friends. They are protecting the turf that this government has helped them to steal. Mm -hmm. They don't have a right to be in our communities. They don't have a right to police us. And we shouldn't ask for anything less than our liberation. So, you know, when we demand 50% and they say, how about some 81 recommendations? We just keep demanding our 50%. We keep focused on the things that we believe are actually going to contribute to life and health and safety. And we don't compromise that which is most valuable to us, life, freedom, opportunity, safety. Thanks for that, Desmond. Um, we, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so this is from Pamela. I, I appreciate your perspective on land back. I think we forget that when we try to address homelessness, she says, as a First Nations woman, I'm glad that you wrote in your book and had these discussions. How would you encourage the youth that we have here? Pamela, thank you for that. I want to tell everybody um, about what I was doing earlier this week. I was in Hamilton, which is um, an hour train ride outside of Toronto. And I was there because a group of mostly black Muslim youth decided to camp out in front of Hamilton City Hall. They have done this because there are over 20 homeless encampments in Hamilton right now. And um, rather than provide housing for people, what we're seeing, not just in Hamilton, but in cities across Canada, is that the police become the answer. The police come into these encampments and they cut up people's tents. They throw their possessions in the garbage. And if people get in their way, they arrest and charge them and sometimes assault them. This is happening during a global pandemic. This is happening during a time where shelter spaces across Canada are being reduced because it's not safe to even keep the amount of people warehoused in shelters that we usually do. The courage of these young folks in Hamilton, I got to see it firsthand earlier this week and I went and I slept on the hard ground with them on Monday night because they are such incredible, courageous young people who are leading, you know, while the governments, while the politicians want to have their hundredth conversation about what should we do. And while I was there, there was a rotating cadre of dozens of police officers who had nothing better to do than stand around the encampment at City Hall and try to intimidate the hell out of everybody who was there. Just down the road from Hamilton though, is the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. And, um, you know, the, um, the land that was supposed to be for the Six Nations, um, the Haldeman Tract. And I bring up Six Nations of the Grand River in this context because they are also fighting a land claim struggle in that territory right now. And I've also been there recently. And that struggle has to do with a developer who wants to build 1400 homes on Six Nations territory. The OPP have been doing the same thing to the Six Nations that the Hamilton police are doing to that encampment, patrolling them day and night, trying to intimidate them, trying to snatch up members of their communities and criminalize them. And yet in the midst of everything, 
the Six Nations folks had time to make a solidarity statement with the folks in Hamilton and to say, just as we're fighting for land, we're fighting for safety. We're fighting for proper housing and proper services and supports for our community. We see that you folks in Hamilton are doing the same thing. And we are united in our struggle. We are united in our anti-colonial fight. So to all the young people who are listening to this, I'm seeing it happen in Hamilton. I'm seeing it happen at the Six Nations of the Grand River. I'm seeing young people in my community who are tired of this talk and who are tired of the stalling tactics and they are taking action and they are getting results and they are inspiring one another and they're inspiring people like myself to keep doing this work. And you have the power inside you to do the exact same thing. And you can lead where other people in your community choose to stand by and watch, choose to remain silent. Um, our struggles are connected. And so remember when you're engaged in your struggle where you are, that there are other people in other communities, particularly young people, this next generation who are facing the climate crisis, the unknown world of the future that has been so weighed down by pollution um, and by carbon and by the, the, the pollution of our water, the pollution of land and the contamination of soil. The youngest generation is attuned and is fighting. And when we can see each other and when we can collaborate with each other, man, we can do unbelievable things. I am like, I couldn't have had um, that conversation that I was talking about earlier in Selkirk. If young people in BC, black and other racialized people hadn't talked to me and shared their own experiences with me. And so I share mine with you this evening in a spirit of connection and of seeing one another and of knowing that we can and will win when we, you know, when we honor the different struggles that we're going through, but see that the bigger picture is that we're really fighting towards a collective safer future for clean air, for clean water, for safety, for true safety that does not come in a uniform at the barrel of a gun. These are the things that we can achieve and that we have to dream because those who came before us, they might not have seen these things as being possible, but it is our ability to dream of them as being possible that actually sets us to a new place that pushes us to do something that hasn't been done yet. Thank you so much, Desmond. We really appreciate you coming to talk to us tonight. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of us will take what you've said really to heart and to put that into practice. Thank you so much to mod for moderating. Thank you to the Lethbridge Public Library System. Thank you very much to our interpreter this evening who did this all by yourself. I really <laughs> appreciate you being here also. Thank you so much. Thanks, Desmond. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thanks for attending.